Monday with my boy Bradley. Bradley, say hey. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bradley. Uh, let the folks know where you're from and the work that you do. Uh, I am originally from Washington, D.C., but I live in Brooklyn, New York right now. And mm -hmm. wow, I am just a community activist. It's, it's just a very easy way to say what I do. Okay. Tell us about your job. <clears throat> what pays the bills? What pays the bills is community act activism. <laughs> nah. <laughs> the actual job. No. Um, so the actual title is called Testing and Navigations Coordinator. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I go out to the bridges and the parks. In um, New York. Yes, in New York at the train stations, wherever there are um, homeless people, um, substance users, sex workers, things mm -hmm. of that nature to provide services for them like HIV testing, Hep C testing, mm -hmm. um, link them to care if they need it, and you know, just show them somebody cares. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, what brought you into that job that you work currently? So what brought me to the work, I just always knew that my life was to be of service, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, it just took a while to get there and figure out what it actually looks like. So I started volunteering at some, so mm -hmm. others may eat on mm -hmm. O Street, mm -hmm. like North Capitol and O Street. Yeah, that used to be on New York Ave back in the day and then they moved it. Yeah, so like, mm -hmm. let's just backtrack a little bit. One day I was sitting at my dead end job at the dry cleaners. Can you give us that year? Um, I believe it was 2015. What year were we that's, roommates? That's when, that's when we were roommates, yes. 2015. 2015. And I yeah. like was there, nothing was going on. And I just was like, I'm not a bad person, mm -hmm. but I'm not necessarily a good person. Yeah. And I know that I want to do a lot in my life, but I'm just here, like existing. And it, it just brought me to tears so mm -hmm. I um, bought a composition book and I wrote on the front of it like get your shit together or something like that and I would like write inspirational quotes in it and I remember turning all the way to the back and putting things that make me feel whole mm -hmm. and like connecting to a higher power was one of them. Mm -hmm. It was like five different things, but I remember like connecting to how higher power and being of service to people were like the main two. Mm -hmm. So I wrote that list down and I like started volunteering that week, like at some. Mm -hmm. And I thought like, oh, this is nice. Like I could do this. Um, it's very different because I've never worked with a homeless population before, mm -hmm. but I was like, this feels good. And then I just stuck with it for such a long time mm -hmm. that like, at one point I just became staff. Like, it just, they was like, yo, you're here just like us in the morning. Mm -hmm. You stay late. Like, we've never had a volunteer like you. And I just was like, thank you. People aren't doing this. You're telling me people aren't doing this? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> So I left the dry cleaners and I like started to work for them. Mm -hmm. <sighs> But then I fractured my foot. Mm. I fractured my foot and then it like sent me into like a depression because I like had to move and I had to... Do you to... remember what kind of fracture that was? I sure do. It was um, it was the fracture of my fifth metatarsal bone. So you the, broke your fifth metatarsal too? The bone that connects like your pinky bone mm -hmm. to your to your ankle mm -hmm. and like where I fracture mines was at was at the tip where there was low mm -hmm. blood flow. Mm -hmm. Wow, you fractured yours in a bad place. I fractured mine's back in the bigger part of the bone making a tackle in college. Lucky you, because mm -hmm. I'm sure it healed quicker. I was like Oh uh, no, it still gives me pain. Oh man, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I have that like phantom pain mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. I still have my I still have a big screw in my foot. You know what? Mm -hmm. I actually did not have to get surgery. Like, mm -hmm. when I was supposed to get surgery, my insurance collapsed. Mm. And I was like, no, oh my God. But, like, life worked out for me because mm -hmm. it healed. Anyway, I'm rambling. Um, no, no, that's important. I was actually going to say, tell me about what depression was like for you at that part of your life. Um, You know, it 
I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't see the end of it because mm -hmm. I had to quit my job. Well, I didn't quit it, but they like were like, yeah, we ain't got nothing for you. Like, we ain't got no disability or nothing for you. We aren't gonna fire you, so you can't collect unemployment. Mm -hmm. So I, like, had to, like, go see if I can get, like, food stamps and emergency, like, cash assistance and, like, figure out insurance. Did that change what job security looked like for you in life? Yeah, because then I had to, like, move out my apartment. Um, I had to move in with family and then oh my god it just was like crazy i like was literally like bouncing from um an aunt house that i was uncomfortable at to mm -hmm. like back with my mother and we didn't have a really good relationship to my aunt and uncle in waldorf mm -hmm. i just was like yo this is it was really given what it was supposed to have gave. oh my god it was really hard for me because i had always been such an independent person and then like when i moved out of the house i just mm -hmm. had always been just independent so it was really hard to depend on people mm -hmm. be it family or friends because it was like i need things but i don't know how to ask for things mm -hmm. and i just really wasn't happy i really just was like <sighs> and then i gained all the weight <laughs> that i still haven't lost <laughs> well how did you find joy in scissor <laughs> <laughs> music Yes, because that year also Control came out. Mm -hmm. um, I just was watching a lot of movies. Even though I couldn't see the end of like my healing for my foot or like moving out of my depression, mm -hmm. I did like still like plan to do things and like I was writing and I try to I was trying to be productive with that time, but like depression was serious. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, I can't even get up some days. Yeah. It was horrible. How do you deal with depression now? Um, you know what? I just, I meditate a lot. I do a lot of crystal work, mm -hmm. um, essential oils. I have an altar. Um, and most people altars are usually like at a table, mm -hmm. but I put mine really, really low to the ground yeah. so I can like really sit in it and like really be present with the elements and things that are at my altar. Um, man, I have a gratitude journal. I read a lot of books. Um, Tell me about your gratitude journal. Um, I actually got it from Five Below for five dollars, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and every day it just asks like, "What are you on the budget?" Yes, actually, I have so many of them. I probably should just bought a really expensive one, but um, yeah, it just asks me, "What am I grateful for? How mm -hmm. am I going to take care of myself today? Like, what what inspired me today, and things like that? Um, did I drink water? Like, mm -hmm. how much did I exercise?" Um, what does downtime look like for me? And it also, like, each month, it also has this cute thing mm -hmm. where just, like, each day, just, like, quick bullet of, like, what were you grateful for today? Okay. So what were you grateful for today? You know what? I'm still grateful for the work that I do mm -hmm. because every time I am met with, like, some office politic white supremacist we do good work white savior bullshit mm -hmm. i'm always ready to like throw in the towel and be like i'm gonna just worry marry a white man and <laughs> participate in corporate greed but like people the participants the community that i serve they really 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 know i'm there for them and I don't know if it's just the universe that sends somebody, but they always, every time I'm like, every time I'm literally on a computer, like looking for a new job, mm -hmm. I go to work the next day <clears throat> and someone's like, yo, you cannot leave. Like, we love you. Like, you've helped and you care. And it's just, I'm just, I'm just there for people. I'm just there for people. Like, I, I personally don't want no kids. Mm -hmm. But um, I always always think, like, yo, like, these are, like, my kids. Like, 
and I didn't have a really good childhood, so I like treat them how I wanted to be treated, how I want to be treated, mm -hmm. and they, and they really know I'm there for them, and it makes me so happy. When you said these are my kids, describe your kids. Let me know about the folks that you take care of in the community that you serve. Um, some are substance users. Some <coughs> are homeless. Some, mm -hmm. well, a lot of my. Most, a lot of my kids are homeless. Mm -hmm. And when I say kids, like they aren't younger than me. Like these yeah. people are well into their like 40s and 50s. Um, and I look at them as like, not even just kids, but like aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters. Um, they're substance users, they're homeless, they struggle with mental health issues. Um, it's just a lot of different things. But I'm, I always show up for them. I always show up for them. Mm -hmm. Do you have two stories you can share with me about them and your visits? Yeah, so one of them mm -hmm. I met doing outreach underneath the bridge. Um, a lovely, a lovely uh, trans woman mm -hmm. um, struggles with a substance use and also is homeless. And you know what? I just. I just loved on her. I just loved on her and just, I don't know, she is my sister. She is, it's really hard to explain what I do because it's not anything that I can say out loud and I can legally. revisit it. Not even legally, but mm -hmm. like, I just really <clears throat> am a person of action. Mm -hmm. I know that I talk so much and I do all these really great things, but I'm really like, when people ask, I'm like, I, I don't know. It, it just comes really natural to me to like have so much humility towards people mm -hmm. and like to like even give them a hug and people are like, yo, you know, they like haven't bathed and they might have bed bugs and I'm like, but they also need this human touch because I'm re-establishing their connection to trust people again. Yeah. So like, if I can touch you, put my hand on your shoulder, and if you allow me to hug you, or even sometimes feed you, like mm -hmm. sometimes I go above and beyond and I give way too many snacks than I'm supposed to, but I'm like, I know that once these doors close, mm -hmm you're hungry you're gonna need something even the um another Human life can't be dictated by a budget or by a nine to five because every every job i've ever worked i've always like looked back at the building thinking like where like what's gonna happen to like the people like mm -hmm. what where are they gonna go like you know it makes me so sad it, like even making me emotional right now but like I just know like tomorrow they're gonna be great and I'm gonna like give them A1 white glove service and yeah, it's just really hard. It's just one of them things like you just have to see me in action because I don't know how to like mm -hmm. really express it. Mm -hmm. But like when people tell me how they see me, I'm like, I don't know. I, I like really just do this shit from the heart because I really do care. Like. Mm -hmm. Even there's a guy when I <coughs> drive to work sometimes because I live in Brooklyn and work in Harlem. Yeah. Um, and parking is crazy. If anybody knows anything about New York, mm -hmm. there's so many fucking cars. <laughs> um, yeah, like even there's a guy on the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm like, I can't give you money every fucking day, sir. But yeah. But I know there's these snacks out here and I'm going to take as much as I can because I'm not driving every day, but I want to make sure you good for the week or good until I see you again. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into, well, so I used to first give him money and then I used to like consciously be like, oh, like somebody got a dollar or somebody got something so I can like consciously like, I'm going past the Brooklyn Bridge today. I'm going to give him this money. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just came to a point where I'm like, this man needs something. This man is collecting money because he needs something. So one day, traffic, I'm just like, hey, like one, what's your name? And two, what do you need? Like, what do you need? So when you are collecting, if I can get you what you need, all this money that you're collecting is just for whatever you're collecting. Yeah. Um, so he told me, his name is Skip, I can tell you his name is Skip. Mm -hmm. Um, so Skip 
yeah, I just started getting him what he needed. And then he told me one day I hadn't seen him in a while and I just had stuff in my trunk for him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, me and my brother, we um, <clears throat> are like about to lose our housing. And I'm like, you have a brother? Like what also does he need? So mm-hmm. I can like, cause if you guys are together and you bringing all this home, cause I'm giving you this, let me help him out too. Yeah. So if you have one more person you can, prov- you can provide for, you know, it's instead of just oh everything skip. It's like oh skipping his brother. Yeah. I, I, I can give them more things because there's two people instead of one now. So yeah, and and this <clears> story <throat> with Skip, and then we have, so I have reestablished this trust for people within Skip. So mm-hmm. Skip can be honest about his substance use, right? Mm-hmm. So and that's not me judging him. That's me saying, are you using safely? Because mm-hmm. also I work at a harm reduction organization where mm-hmm. we understand like yo in a perfect world everybody's fucking abstinent from every vice that everyone has mm-hmm. but we also understand that like yo this helps reduce the risk until they're ready for abstinence mm-hmm. so like skip was really honest with me so now i can provide him with um fresh syringes i can give him a sub container so he can dispose of his syringes so he's not just throwing them in the garbage or throwing them in the parks or Mm -hmm. wherever he's at um i've offered testing to skip like i will come to you and test you right there like Mm -hmm. rapid testing um do you need housing help skip like i will park my car walk up and down the street with you so I can get you what you need because I, I don't want you to miss any money right here, right? So mm-hmm. these are the things that like, I just think about sometimes and I'm so grateful for the person that I am because mm-hmm. <laughs> I could be a mean girl, but yeah, yes, but like when I sit in a car and I think of like all the fuck shit that happens like at these organizations, including mine. Mm-hmm. Um, just, Tell me about some of the fuck shit. <laughs> so you got a few days so you got parts to your life um I just think <clears throat> when white people mm-hmm. are the head of an organization that serves black and brown people mm-hmm. they don't have the lived experience of black and brown people yeah um, they tend to make decisions based off what they think will work, based mm-hmm. off of their experiences, based mm-hmm. off of some data or research bullshit they've read. So they're not listening to what the black and brown people say mm-hmm. is and is not going to work, which just frustrates me so much. Yeah, and because I, people are numbers on the paper. People aren't numbers. And the beautiful thing about me is like, I'll get you your numbers, but I'm also people centered first. Mm-hmm. I, what do you, like, what do the people need first? Mm-hmm. Cause they're not gonna come to me if I'm just like, and first of all, I think another thing is, they think these people are stupid. Yeah. Flat out think they're idiots. Mm-hmm. But these people know when we, when I first started coming out there, yeah. they're just like, we know you're just another organization to promise us stuff because you need numbers. They know this, they know mm-hmm. this. And then we don't have an incentive to give them things yeah. all of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just like, you want me to pull numbers, but you're not giving me time to connect with people. And this, mm-hmm. is, the, this is the whole job. This is the <clears throat> whole organization. Yeah. And if we believe in harm reduction, you're not reducing harm by like rushing everything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm public enemy number one because I do speak up for my community and- <laughs> So you're the enemy for speaking up for your community. I am. That you care about. I that am. That you actually go and see in person. And you know what? I've had a lot of disciplinary action Mm write-ups that are not focused on... Well, Bradley's nasty to the participants. He has a nasty attitude towards the participants. Mm -hmm. He's not making his quota, blah, 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 blah. It's always 
Bradley has an attitude with upper management. Bradley is this, Bradley is that. And I always have to sit there and advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. One thing is very true about me. I am not new to this work. I am very, very true to it. Mm -hmm. So if you are fucking with my community, you yeah. are fucking with me. Yeah. And I don't think white people get that. And it, and it just, that white savior complex of like, oh, I'm doing this good work for these people and they appreciate it. And it's like, but are you? But mm -hmm. are you though? Because you're causing harm to the to the black and brown people who are doing the work. When you say, but are you, what, what would you like them to consider when you ask the questions, but are you? Consider the, the opinions of the people who work the front line. Mm -hmm. Like, period. Just consider those opinions of like, you hired us because we have lived experience. Mm -hmm. You hired us because we care. You hired us because we have humility for this population of people. Mm -hmm. But you're not listening to what we're saying. So how does that work? How does how does that work in a grand scheme of things? Yeah. It doesn't. And like I said, I work for a harm reduction agency and they're really, really good at reducing harm around substance use. Tell me more. They're really good at the syringe exchange, mm -hmm. the um, safer consumption and injection sites, um, overdose prevention, responding to those type of things. Mm -hmm. But they're not people centered. They're not. They're just not people centered. There's a lot that goes on with Black and Brown people. We all know the health disparities. Mm -hmm. We all know the intersectionality of people's lives, and it's just like mm -hmm. substance use is not the only one. Mm -hmm at all so it's just like when I say these things they're like but we're working on it and I'm like no you're working on the substance use part you're not yeah, working on the working overall on the person. person yeah which I do and which people love me for so mm -hmm. that frustrates me a lot a lot mm -hmm. what do you um in terms of the way the company is structured for the work that you do, especially within that population, um, are there alternatives in terms of like suggestions that can be made? Or at the end of the day, if the white people don't listen, nothing in the organization itself is going to change. And is it a nonprofit? Yes, it is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> loaded question. Thank you for asking me that question. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that senior leadership should not be senior leadership. I think in tell me, a, tell me more. Let's break that down right there. So I think in a grand scheme of like nonprofit work, organizations that work for black and brown people, they always have like a corporate structure, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we are trying to dismantle like white supremacy and like policing of black and brown bodies, mm -hmm. why are we still using capitalism as a model mm -hmm. for what we do? So I totally get it. Like we need senior leadership, right? Mm -hmm. But it should be really like top down. Like frontline people should be at the top of everything you do, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're out there. Like I am personally out there. Like I am underneath the bridges, at the metro stations, in shooting galleries, mm -hmm. which is something I've never done before. What's but, a shooting gallery? Uh, where people go and use, usually like injection drugs and stuff like that, which is, what I learned, is different from a trap house, mm -hmm. where people are usually like just like smoking weed and stuff, and like maybe popping like pills and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but here I am like, yeah, no, this doesn't work. But they love to like bark orders and say, well, I'm senior leadership, so um, this is the way it is. And like I said before, I'm Bradley Otis Chambers and I am not new to this. I am very true to this and that don't work for my community. And yeah. I'm telling you, I'm not doing it. Yeah. So that's where the di disciplinary actions come up. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, he is being assertive and that comes off as insubordinate. And it's like, no, but isn't this what it's founded on? Like, mm -hmm. isn't this the work that y'all do founded on people? Yeah. And I just am a daily reminder of, 
<laughs> we're here for the people, not for your own needs. Yeah. Do you ever see them go past the desk that they sit by when it comes to the community that they serve? No, not at all. And sometimes I have to bring a person to them. Because they always will, we have, sometimes we have high need people, like special cases. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have a morning meeting with a supervisor. And then uh, sometimes we'll have a meeting with a director and we'll like debrief them on what's happening. And they're like, well, have you tried this? And I'm just like, <laughs> one of my, one of, what like really grinds my gears is when they're like, have you tried talking to the person? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you set your ass right there and listen to what I had to say and you mm -hmm. thought I just said I, well, how do you think I was communicating with this person? You think we were just smoke signaling? Like, I just was <laughs> what you that drives me up the ladder to the roof. So, one instance, we were mm -hmm. talking about like someone who like suffers from like severe mental illness, like mm -hmm. anything you can imagine, he's like kind of is suffering from it so like yeah. the director's like well have you tried to talk to him have you sent him to the medical hub have you done this have you done that and i'm like we've done it all like what like what do you think you just mm -hmm. it just blows me so he's like i would like to meet him but he was avoiding him like the plague mm -hmm. for like three weeks so when they was like oh yeah he still hasn't met him i was like oh that's crazy i'm like John Doe, come with me. Uh, somebody wants to meet you. So mm -hmm. I took him to the third floor and I was like, John, this is who you wanted to talk to. So here he is right here. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make the connection. And he literally, the director said, all of the stuff that we've been saying. And it's just like... He stuck to the script. He couldn't have lip. He couldn't put any heart in it. But he couldn't put any heart in it. He had no conviction. Yeah. But you also sat there and did all the things that we did. So mm -hmm. you you bark orders at us and you did the same thing and it just didn't yeah. work. So what's the issue? And you show proof that like, hey, the thing that you're upset about, it doesn't work for you either. So what's the next step now that you've seen that it hasn't worked? And up to this point, I assume the next step never came. It never came. Mm -hmm. he, he has said nothing else after that. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And I'm just like, it's crazy. I just be like, I told y'all. Mm -hmm. And I'm a Virgo. Don't don't give me the satisfaction of telling you I told you so. Because yeah. I will live in that moment. It's going to be in your face forever. Yeah, because I'm going to continuously tell you I told you so. Mm -hmm. And I've been at this particular organization for seven months. And I'm consistently consistently, constantly telling these people, told you so, mm -hmm. told you so, mm -hmm. told you so. <laughs> and I love it, because I'm just like, why do y'all think we're idiots? Why do you think staff is it? Like staff, everyone under senior leadership's an idiot. Mm -hmm. And why do you think the people we serve are idiots? And why do you think people view us as such? I don't know. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. And you know, <clears throat> I'm reading a book right now called, um, mm, I just blinked on me. It's a really good book. In it, oh, Black Fatigue. Yes. Mm -hmm. Black Fatigue. And it, like, to borrow that book when you're done with it. Yeah. You know what? You can actually have it because the whole time I've read it, I've just been rolling my eyes. Because mm -hmm. when we like ask these questions, like, well, why do you think? this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you know what? White this, white that, black this, black that. And you're like, yeah. But then when you like read about it, you're like, yo, we still going through this shit? Mm -hmm. Like we still doing this shit? Like we like, every like meeting or training I go to, I'm like, white people, do you not see all the problem? Mm -hmm. Like. Well, when you say you're the problem, like, Give me an example. So, white people don't have to see race. White people don't have to see injustice. White people don't have to care because it's not their lived experience. It's not their history. Like, white people haven't gone through just generational trauma that we live through, right? Yeah. So, like, even 
I have never been a slave. I don't know any, like, I've never had my family history tell me about a slave, but Mm -hmm. I feel the trauma from it because it was passed down to my great-grandparents who passed it down to my grandmother who has Mm -hmm. in turn passed it down to my mother who has then turned to pass it down to me. So... Mm -hmm. I didn't think anxiety was a real thing until I like really started doing this work. And I'm just like, I feel a lot of anxiety behind this because Mm -hmm. white people at the top are really stopping me from really helping my my community. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about the white people I see Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the white people in higher positions to help. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is- And they uphold. In order to uphold white supremacy, you have to uphold capitalism. Mm -hmm. And they're they're upholding it. So what you're saying is they built the foundation and these organizations, quote unquote, to help. But the way they define help isn't the way the community needs help. Asterisk. Help. Mm -hmm. Help has an asterisk by it. Yeah. And then when you take that step to actually help your community in the way your community would like to be helped, they're like, oh no, we don't do that. I'm Even aggressive. though they have I'm insubordinate. the capability to help in the way that's necessary without spending funds. It just be like little things. So like, mm-hmm. so for example, good examples. <clears throat> they tell me they're not giving me food anymore, right? For the folks that you help. Yeah, for like that any incentives and stuff like part that. Part of your relationship is built on in the community. Is feeding them. Mm-hmm. So I got the connection to get fresh fruits and produce delivered mm-hmm. every Wednesday. And not just like a bag or two, but like crates and crates, crates of, of shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just like, all right, well, this is what I've been able to do. So mm-hmm. can we start like a nutrition course or whatever? Or like, can we, because we don't have a kitchen, but I'm like, if y'all get some like burners up in here, I'm mm-hmm. not a cooker. But <laughs> we, like, there's this lady who is in the community. Her name is Mama Mo. I'm like, yo, mm-hmm. if I can give it to her, she can like whip up some shit. Shout out I've, to Mama Mo. I've connected with another lady at another organization who grows mm-hmm. fresh fruits and vegetables at the organization. So you've reached out to other And make stuff, because I'm just yeah. like, Yo, like, these people, somebody in the community, somebody who's working for another community mm-hmm. organization, are, like, making moves. Are these like, in different boroughs? Um, so, Mama Mo lives in Harlem. She lives close to the job. And mm-hmm. then the other borough, well, the other organization has buildings in all boroughs. Mm-hmm. But most specifically, I think the one person I'm thinking of, she works out of the Bronx. Mm-hmm. But she kind of like goes to all of them and she like also teaches a class because I'm also like Yo, this like food nutrition and like substance use go hand in hand mm-hmm. and I took this lady's course and she was telling me like Yo, like nothing hit like being healthy and on, and on heroin like being a vegan and on heroin because your high is just much longer mm-hmm. um, And I'm like yo, I can like take that and integrate it into mm-hmm. my shit, and I have. Mm-hmm. In I terms have. of what you've learned. Yeah, yeah. I, I have been able to feed these people mm-hmm. fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a drop-in center, and I see- What's a drop-in center? So a drop-in center is just like a drop-in center sounds, and it's like if the people come in to mm-hmm. like just sit, drink coffee, chit-chat with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, see case managers, they can go to Holistic, they can use the bathroom, we have a medical hub, they can shower, mm-hmm. things of that nature. How close to normal would these people be if you didn't know that they were users? Um, so you know, I, some people are very like, mm-hmm. stereotypical users, like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to pinpoint anybody, yeah. but like, you know, just think of like what you think a user is. Some mm-hmm. people are like that. And some people, you and I, some people, you would never know. You would never know. They walked in the, first of all, the, I think the most beautiful thing about my organization is they do hire active users. Okay. And so, and so they actually hire active users to work for the organization. Yes. Mm-hmm. Still keep in mind that asterisk mark, the help mm-hmm. is still asterisk mark. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, so in conversation with a lot of my coworkers, and they just like, yeah, and they say something, and I'm just like, what? Like you? And they're like, yeah, and I have to like dial it back because I know I'm like, I'm not judging, but I'm also like, this blows my mind mm -hmm. and like reduces the stigma that I think like what a substance user looks like. Because mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh, you like... Even when it comes to hard drugs. Yeah, because like, yo, like people are like parents. People are like picking their kids up from school, like mm -hmm. daily helping with homework, mm -hmm. like cooking and like just living normal lives. And I'm like, oh, I would... You would have never known. Never known. isn't a war on drugs mm -hmm. it's a war on black and brown people no, tell me more about that because what do you mean by that white people use drugs white mm -hmm. people the same because we're in east harlem mm -hmm. i see a lot more black and brown people yeah. but if you look at data yeah white, white people, people use drugs more than black people white people do more opiate type drugs than mm -hmm. what than black and brown people but, the way but white treated. people, yeah, but white people are getting the help. Mm -hmm. and well, I, you gotta define getting the help, like. So this is the thing. So mm -hmm. what you've come to observe from my many years, not just this mm -hmm. this job in New York, but mm -hmm. from my many years. With reference to other jobs. Yeah. So um, I've been. I've worked with LGBT youth in DC. Yes. Mm -hmm. in a very abstinent based kind of way and I've seen how like abstinent based mm -hmm. treats people um, I've worked with a homeless population in DC mm -hmm. I've worked with older gay men older black gay men mm -hmm. in Virginia mm -hmm. I've worked with um, a gay population in the Bronx and now here I am again with you working with all types of people yeah. who come through my doors they aren't necessarily substance users right mm -hmm. but right now we're talking about substance users mm -hmm. so in all these jobs that I've had right yeah and all the people that I talk to um, even doctors who I've talked to right who do the work do the work mm -hmm. um, they've noticed like white people get more help and more access to things black people don't. So even like, if we think about someone wants to wing themselves off of heroin, mm -hmm. they go on a methadone program. Mm -hmm. So they will get a higher dose of methadone mm -hmm. than a black person do. Mm -hmm. But let, let's remove substance use from the equation, right? Yeah. So even just think about going to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And like you're in pain and you get the Tylenol 800s, right? Mm -hmm. And then you talking to like John and them and he got fucking perks and you like, what the fuck? Like, I'm in pain and you're like, where you getting the perks from? Like, yeah, why am I getting the Tylenol 800s and he's getting the perks and our situations are exactly the same? Yeah. I just, I really just feel like, hey man, I wanna do better. I mean, it's not even. But is it your fault? Like, no, it's not. And I think that's the problem with mm -hmm. when black and brown people do the work. Mm -hmm. We always take the burden of like, oh, man, it's me. It's like, how can I help my community? And and that's how I feel. I'm always like, how can I? I like go home and think, mm -hmm. how can I better serve my community? Like, yeah. what can I do for these people, for my, my uncles, aunts, brothers and sisters, the people who walk through this door? What can I do? And it's, it's not a us problem because we show up for each other yeah. we, we got each other it's really not and it really just as I get older like bothers me that I have to continuously have these conversations with white people who don't get it like even now it's become where I just if I'm in a training about like some culture competency type shit mm -hmm. I sit in the back because yeah. I get it like mm -hmm. like no nah, Caleb, Caleb, sit your ass in the front. Be the first one in the front. Like, I'm gonna be here in the back because I get it. I get it. Mm -hmm. That's why, even reading the book, Black Fatigue, I get so like, oh, this, like, we still going through this? Like, this is some bullshit. Like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really gets me. But back to the drop in center. So, yeah. I noticed that <clears throat> the donations was getting ran through. Like, people 
hit it. Like once yeah. once that shit go out there, mm-hmm. they take in whatever. They don't even be needing half the shit. Mm-hmm. So then I've noticed like people come in and they're like, oh, I need shoes, I need a sweater, I need a coat. I don't got nothing to wear. I've been wearing this for five days. Mm-hmm. I like made a closet. Like I literally was like asking everybody like, even my roommate, I'm just like, she was selling stuff at Buffalo Exchange. And I just Tell me about this closet. It's literally just a closet full of like clothes for people. Mm-hmm. Period. Just clothes for people. So I don't put it out on the rack in the drop in center. Mm-hmm. But if I'm in conversation with somebody or I overhear somebody saying, I need pants, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, let me check for you. Let me go see. Like, or, oh, I need shoes. Yeah. And so, like, right now, <laughs> They're in my trunk because my organization is going through a change right now. So, Mm -hmm. but I'm just like, yeah. So if I hear somebody, I'm like running to my car, no matter how far it is. I'm like, you said you need something? Here I come. Like, I'll be right back. What size you wear? Mm -hmm. You said you need shoes? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got some in the house. Let me, let me come back tomorrow. Yes. Like I'm, I'm so committed to my community Mm -hmm. and it makes me so happy. And I think. Every, that you're able to accomplish this with your community. Yeah, and you know what? Here I am getting emotional again because it took me so long to find what I was good at. And I'm so good at this because it comes so natural to me. Mm-hmm. And I, it just makes me so happy. Like, it brings so much joy to my heart that, like, I sometimes, like, cry about it. Like, even when I was coming down here, I just was like... Yo, I did some really amazing shit. Like, mm-hmm. like it's not a lot, but like in seven months, I've been able to get fresh fruit and produce, and I like, mm-hmm. give them out. Yeah, I've been able to make this closet. Like, I've been able to like celebrate our women because I like run a women's group. At first, <laughs> at first I was like, I don't know why the fuck they want me run this women's group. You're running a women's group, or you are currently running a women's group. I'm currently running it. When they gave it to me, I was like... They gave a man. I think sometimes they just be giving me shit because I'm a gay person. Mm-hmm. Just And it just like, oh, you'll, you'll like do well at it. And I'm mm-hmm. just like, but wasn't somebody else already doing this before me? And they were doing well at it. So like, why, why pass the buck to me? Let them continue to do well at that shit. Do you feel there's a lack of sensitivity in moments like that, though? Because you're doing good at it. Yeah, but, but it was like, it's mm-hmm. really like a women's group. And it's like, sometimes I want to be a part of it. Like, oh, mm-hmm. like, yes, we like want to uplift the black woman. We want to do this. We want to uplift the trans women. But it's like, mm-hmm. sometimes they need their space away yeah. from like a gay black man, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I want to help. And so even in the group, I have a... A partner, a, a co-facilitator, yeah. where I just kind of just like let her take the lead, mm-hmm. and I just kind of like clean up and like you need something, like let me get you, let me refresh your drink, like let me you know do stuff like that, because I know they need that space where they yeah. can just be themselves. Like I, I'm happy making the flyers, like pushing the group, supporting the group, making the gift bags, mm-hmm. but I never wanted to be like, why this man always here? You know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. like. But it, it's also a really great experience for me, and I've been able to, like, uplift a lot of our, like, women of trans, black women of trans experience. Like, they've really felt it from me. I even got a really great text message from one of the girls who were like, yo, like, gay niggas don't be caring about us. Like, mm-hmm. they don't, and here you are, like, celebrating me. Like, you got me a whole fucking cake with my name on it, balloons and gifts, and... Mm-hmm. You like are celebrating me as a person, and I'm just like, yo, you like, just a, you're cool. Like I just mm-hmm. respect you. Like yeah, I just respect you, and that's all I be asking people to do. Just respect people. Just mm-hmm. respect them. But I put the black trans women and women mm-hmm. in the forefront of what I do. Yeah, because it's important. It's really important to like, especially with the population I work with, like. Mm-hmm. There's so many intersections right there. Just being black and trans, then we've added substance use, we've added um, homelessness, we've added mental illness, mm-hmm. like we've added barriers to getting help. So when yeah. I say that, like 
I am there to reconnect them to trusting people. Mm-hmm. It's really, really important. So important. Yeah. It's just so fucking important. Yeah. And I wish I had a tissue for you. I could see you tearing up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because it's, it's really important. Take it's just such... It's so many tissues. <laughs> 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 but no, it's really important. And mm-hmm. like, and even though I say this and I'm like centering my work around uh, black women, cis, and trans, like mm-hmm. I also do a lot of work with uplifting the men because yeah. even when I go under the bridge, the women don't want to leave their men. Mm-hmm. And I can't forget about them. Yeah. So I have to, whatever I'm doing for them, mm-hmm. for the women, I have to do for the men. Yeah. So it's just like, bring me really closer to like, just my community and who I am as a person. And like, when I leave work, I'm always frustrated with the powers that be. But mm-hmm. when I leave work and I'm like walking from the building, like people are like, oh, have a good day, Bradley. Like, see you tomorrow. Like giving me hugs I'm like yo this is all worth it like this is why I come to work like I don't come to work to like cuss out white people all day I come to work to help these people mm-hmm. so you know at some point in my life I'm gonna be on senior leadership in an Annalise Keaton coach <laughs> <laughs> like really making moves for people and I understand mm-hmm. like you know, the politics of, like, things. But I also want them to understand is, like, we're people-centered. When I walked through that door, I was 100% for the participants. Mm-hmm. I wasn't there for that goofy shit that yeah. they like to do. I'm yeah. 100% there for the people that I serve. Mm-hmm. And also, it's really cool, because I'm, like, getting to see, like, New York through their eyes, mm-hmm. which is different than, like, you know, Googling shit, going out with my peers and coworkers, but really like hanging out with people where they are and like mm-hmm. listening to their stories. And I'm like, yo, this is really cool. Like, yeah, I really enjoy you guys. <laughs> um, define friendship. Man, I don't have any friends. No, I'm joking. Uh, um, uh, hmm. <laughs> to find a friendship, mm-hmm. I think friendship is someone that you can commune with. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think I like. I just always think about like friendship, like on a community level, like mm-hmm. just a healing space where you can commune with like-minded people. Not necessarily mm-hmm. like-minded people, but like. At some point, the intersectionality is about black lives <laughs> intersect with each other, mm-hmm. and we can relate, and we can heal, we can talk about it, we can have our black joy and our black rage, and just be heard. And also, I have like non-black friends, but I'm mm-hmm. also like, I enjoy one of my really, really good friends in New York. She's a white girl. I just really enjoy that she lets me feel how I feel and say what I feel in the moment Mm -hmm. and she's not like yeah but you know and also you shouldn't she's like yo I get it it's not my battle to fight and I'm just here to support you and I'm just like thank god yeah and she's also like not here to defend that position yeah and she also believes in healing so Mm -hmm. she's an acupuncturist Mm -hmm. um And she just really, like, believes in healing people. So, like, when I'm frustrated and I'm just like, ugh, she's like, yo, I get it. Let me do my thing to unleash some things in you, right? Mm -hmm. So she's really cool. And I really enjoy it. So friendship Mm -hmm. is a community of people that you can heal with and share your lived experience. Yeah. Okay, how has your identity as a black gay man helped you thrive in this space? Oh man, as a black gay man. Did it work with you or against you? Um, in this space. Mm -hmm. The only reason I ask this is because of what that trans woman said. I think in some some cases it helps. In some cases it doesn't because I am 
always evolving, right? Like, I think because of when I came out and what was, like, the information that was available. It was a different time. A very different time. And mm -hmm. so I had been a confident gay black man mm -hmm. um, just growing up. But yeah. then, you know, as you get older and, like, you just experience different things and you're like, I am, like, a non-binary queer person. Mm -hmm. It just, like, it's forever changing. Mm -hmm. And, like, my pronouns are them they but I also don't mind if someone like slips up and call me she because I'm also feminine presenting sometimes so mm -hmm. like this is just forever evolving and it's also like really healing to like mm -hmm. talk to somebody and tell them like have your pronouns changed since the summertime yeah okay because I was like I think in the summer your pronouns are different if I'm not mistaken forever evolving as a mm -hmm. person and I think people see that on the outside like uh it's so hard to like figure out what the LGBTQIA plus community wants, but mm -hmm. we want to be respected, one. Yeah, yeah. Respect. It's, it's top of the key, top of the key, yeah. But also, I always tell people, case by case basis, like you really have to talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, I actually was talking to my coworker about this last night that like on the outside looking in, I just look like a standard gay man. Mm -hmm. But then, like, when you talk to me, like, the layers and the nuances of who I am mm -hmm. is really, like, wow, he's, like, really interesting. Yeah. yeah, and, like, people are, like, really fascinated by me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, like, add in, I add, like, the whole, like, I am here to heal people, and I'm also here to, like, let you know that I'm gonna yeah. fuck you up if you keep playing with me. Yeah. But you know what? I come from a place of love, but sometimes yeah. you gotta let them out. I'll fuck you up in love, okay? I will fuck you up in love. Sometimes. Yeah, necessary. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's definitely helped in some spaces. And then I also have a, a community of gay black men who help me heal in that aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Like, just like this is what we go through too, and like this is how we're healing. Yeah. And, and then shout out to the white in Virginia doing a yeah, great job. Who mm -hmm. also um, just started a podcast called Cleveland Hoochies. Oh, did he? With his roommate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, shout out to Cleveland Hoochies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna bring him on to do an interview with him one day. Definitely coming soon. Yeah, he um, is a great person. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So then I have like black friends, and we talk about. Oh, Mm -hmm. Black healing and things like that. And then you I even call me up when niggas got you fucked up. You know, <laughs> I just be feeling like you just like really. Mm -hmm. There are very few people that I call because I know there there are people who really know me yeah. at my essence, and I and I believe like I always tell people. People can say what they want about me, good and bad, but mm -hmm. two things no one can ever say about Bradley Otis Chambers. Mm -hmm. Is he is disrespectful yeah. and he's a liar. Yeah. So sometimes I just be having to call people who know me to mm -hmm. be like, yo, this is a situation and like yeah. it's rooted in some like gaslight and racist bullshit. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure because sometimes I know I do be tripping. I I will fool I will acknowledge that sometimes I be tripping. Mm -hmm. And I need to hear sometimes, you Bradley, you be tripping or like Yo, no, they got you fucked up, so you need to do this. Yeah. yeah. That's how sometimes I gotta walk in the room like I'm Annalise Keaton. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Yeah, um, no. Okay. One other question before we wrap this up. As a gay presenting black man, when people see you, what does it mean to use the pronouns? They, them, that's, is that correct? They, them, yeah. or she. Um, so and what are the differences? Can you explain that? Yeah, so I think a lot of people think because people use they, mm -hmm. them, that they're non-binary. But like, if you think about it, gender is a, a social contract. So some people just don't want to be defined by their gender. Mm -hmm. Like even hetero, heteronormative people use they, them sometimes, right? And they're like, straight people yeah um i think when it depends on the she one because i am really like mm -hmm. like don't 
don't just meet me and you like, yes, mama, you better work, queen. She she goes off. I'm like, that's, I don't like that. Like, yeah. that's one of them things where I'm just like, but if we in conversation and like, you know, we talking and you know me personally and you're mm -hmm. like, girl, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I'm not like, oh my God, why would you say that? Like, right? Because like, you know me and like, we know each other so you get me, but like, you're not stereotyping me as just like, oh, you're you're just another gay femme presenting guy who like, is a queen. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, but they, them, I'm always surprised when people first ask and then they use them. Cause when people tell me their pronouns are they them, I just continue to use their name. Cause sometimes I'll be like fucking up the English language and I'll be like, oh, I already speak in like Ebonics. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Meryl, Meryl, come on over here. <laughs> just let me know your name. Just let me know your name. Yeah, yeah. like I used to work with um, a non binary person mm -hmm. and I used to just be like, I enjoy that your pronouns are they them, but it's fucking up my ebonic, so I'm gonna just, just continuously say your name. Mm -hmm. But it really makes me happy when people use them though. Okay. It makes me extremely happy when black people use them, and it makes me extremely, extremely happy when older black people use them. It yeah. makes me extremely, extremely, extremely <laughs> happy when the hood niggas use them. Because yeah. sometimes hood niggas be rough. Um, and you know, the most beautiful thing about my job is we got the hood niggas in front of the building doing mm -hmm. what they do. Mm -hmm. um, Product of the environment. Yeah, but you know, I overheard one of them when I was walking in the building, and they just was like, yeah, the LGBTQ community, they everywhere. But it wasn't said like, mm -hmm. oh, the maggots everywhere. But it just was really said like, yo, I'm gonna, I don't know what to say, but I'm gonna respect mm -hmm. the, the, the person, the process, the whatever. And I'm just like, that's really nice. That was really nice of them. Like, and I just overheard it, and I just was like, oh, wow, that's like, they're trying. Yeah, because he could have just, like, let me walk in the building and I could have just overheard him, like, yeah, you know, that maggot, mm -hmm. you know, they everywhere, them maggots everywhere. But, like, he really said it with, like, some caution, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to, like, hit all of them, mm -hmm. which was nice to hear. It's it really nice. It's, okay. It, like, really made me happy. And also, I also want to say, I don't want nobody to think that, like, I connect with every single participant, because sometimes when I am out there giving services. I am called, uh, I'm called all types of fat maggots and bitches and, and you know what I always tell them? I'm like, you don't want my services now, but I'm gonna still come back next week. Mm -hmm. If you don't want my services, I got a partner, we got a whole office of people, you ain't even gotta talk to me, but let me <laughs> give you this little brochure, because I still want you to get the help. Yeah, like, yeah, because it still comes down to the work at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay, so where can everybody find you? Oh man, so I'm on Instagram, uh, illustrative.mindset, and then I'm also on TikTok, because mm -hmm. I started a TikTok for Black Healing. Yeah, and you've done a great job. Um, so Just to let you know, great job. Thank you. So you know what's so funny? The other day, some of my white coworkers had found it, and it was like, oh, it's so exclusive to just like Black Healing. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh my god, oh, that's so exhausting. And I'm just like, that is so exhausting. And I just had to tell them, I'm just like, this this TikTok is not educational in the sense that like I'm out here facilitating a conversation around my blackness for you. Um, it's like that is why this platform exists. Yeah, but I'm just like. But if you would like to share it and show people what I'm doing to help the black and brown people, mm -hmm. like, what's wrong with you? Like, yeah. I just, I really be like... Not that the world isn't centered around you. It doesn't revolve around you. And that's the issue. It is centered around them. So when you try to center it around something else, it's like... Mm -hmm. So why is this not about me and what's going on with me? And I'm just mm -hmm. like... I don't know, like... It, or this thing that you created that's not about me works against me for this reason. And yeah. you're just like, but you're not the focus. That's the goal. But that's what I always tell, that's what I always tell my white coworkers. Like, when I walk into a room, I, I look for black people. Like, I be like, where the black people at? Like, where y'all at? <laughs> where like, the niggas? <laughs> that's exactly how I walk in a room. I'm like... 
and then it boils down to like, where the niggas that's not upholding this capitalism system, this mm-hmm. system, like, where them niggas at? Because like, sometimes you be in a room with the niggas, you like, mm-hmm. I'm gonna go hang out with the white people. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna go here with them. But if something go down, I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Me and you, yeah, we yeah, not. Yeah. yeah. We cousins at best. We ain't brothers. Yeah. What's up, cousin? <laughs> yeah, I'm going I'm to just keep my eye from you on the cross room, but I'm hanging out with these white people who got a little bit more sense. No, I got you. I got you. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so funny. But yeah, but like everything I do is black. And you know what? Also about my blackness, mm-hmm. it took me a while to find my blackness, right? Because mm-hmm. like growing up, I... I don't want to say no one paid attention to me, but like, also, I don't think no one paid attention to me. Like, no one was like, you black, this is black, blackly black, black, like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, that's why representation matters so much, because I used to just watch so much TV, and I used to just think as a kid, I'm like, black people don't go to college, like, Mm -hmm. black people not gay, like, black people don't do this, black people don't do that, but no one was there to say, like, uh yes they do like they yes do they are change. like yeah yeah it's like what's going on like what's who's teaching you these things yeah. and i just remember like going to college and thinking like no one this is how mm-hmm. fucked up it was like my mind <laughs> i i used to think like once i went to high school i used to think like yeah, they, I don't know where all these, like, all my black friends gonna go. Because, like, we all can't go to, like, the fucking local high school. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just usually think when I got to college, I'm like, yeah, I gotta, like, dress like I'm a J. Crew model and, like, hang out with white people. Mm-hmm. And then I remember thinking, like, this, this does not feel authentic to the black experience, to my black experience, mm-hmm. to my gay experience. Mm-hmm. Or to just who I am as a person. It just doesn't feel authentic. Yeah. And I remember I got fired from, like, my job at the J. Crew, And I was thinking, like, oh, man, I got to redefine who I am. <laughs> I, like, I gotta define who the fuck I am as a person. J. Crew gave you a profile. Yeah. And you had to let it go. Yeah, because I was like... I don't think I want to be this person anymore. Because I used to, like, wear boat shoes and seer suckers and, like... Mm-hmm. But now, like, look at me. I'm like... <laughs> I'm, like, out here, like, black this, black that, white, white fragility. Like, I am fatigued because you nigga, I'm like... That's where I'm at in life now. And I'm so happy. Because mm-hmm. it's, it's something just so healing about that journey of, like, finding who you are. Mm-hmm. And also listening to that Beyonce's uh, Lion King soundtrack. Yeah, she was killing that shit. It's, bro. It's, it's very like, yo, I'm it's black. Giving. It's giving. Yeah, and then like, even the music I listen to now, I'm just like, I had to switch from iTunes to Spotify because I'm just like, mm-hmm. yo, this is a lot. I like, I listen to a fucking lot of pop music. Mm-hmm. Like, I shouldn't mm-hmm. listen to this much pop music. <laughs> and then my friend was a DJ. She used to send me playlists. And she's also a house DJ. And I used to be like, house music for white people. And she's like, nah, nigga. Nah, started black. Exactly. Yeah. And these are the things we don't know. It started black, black. So when she told me and sent me things, I'm like, yo, this is very healing. And it's music for the soul. And so now here I am. Yeah. And you also acknowledge the power of media, but we'll get on to that another day. So thank you for coming, Bradley. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you making, you know, um, quality time for this Mental Health Monday sit down and letting folks know about the work that you do. And just, you know, know I'm proud of you, man. Oh, man. We've known each other for uh, almost, let me see, it's about to be 2022. By the time this comes out, it's going to be 2022. So a little bit, and I have a new job. A little bit close to seven years. Man, time flies. Yeah, it was it just does. that. It was just yesterday you was inviting me to mm-hmm. Velvet Lounge for my birthday, and I was yeah. like, "Nigga, no. You see what you I got know, on? You out here with the braids, your beard connected, you all around. Like, I just, we see you out here, man. Man, look at me. 